here at the Red Line March at the end of the COP21 in Paris uh, with Abby Lewis. Um, how do you, uh, we're waiting for the final text of the conference to come out, but how do you assess the dynamics inside the negotiations this time? Well, I've, I've spent a little bit of time inside the Bourget, a lot of time outside the Bourget, but reading all the drafts and talking to all of our comrades who are, you know, with NGOs, especially from the Global South, who are in the negotiations, really watching what happens. I think the rich countries have been incredibly sneaky in these negotiations. And they've done a number of things um, that I don't think will be understood until people really tell, start, tell the stories later of how it all went down. It was clear that the United States, for instance, came into these negotiations wanting to get this question of loss and damage off the table. Loss and damage, the, the billions and billions of euros and dollars of damage that's done by climate-related storms every year. Every time there's a, high, a typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines, every time there are major storms, particularly in the global south. And those countries need help paying just to rebuild after these climate-driven uh, disasters. The United States, that's called loss and damage. The United States wants to keep all of that voluntary, wants to keep all of it in, within the framework of charity, not of historical responsibility for emissions since the Industrial Revolution, not a climate debt, which has to do with a real accounting of who caused the crisis and who's uh, really experiencing the worst effects. So they did some very clever things, like they dangled this 1.5 uh, degree temperature rise target. And they got countries like my country, Canada, really uh, you know, excited that they could play a role. We have a new government in Canada. It's better than the last one. It's nothing like what we need or what we hoped, but they really wanted to have a nice propaganda here in, in Paris. And so they came out strongly for the 1.5, and there was a lot of talk of the 1.5 target. And lots of countries for whom that means the difference between survival and disappearance really you know, worked hard to keep that in the text. In the end, it's very likely to be aspirational. Definitely under two, maybe if we can, 1.5. So it's bullshit. It's not binding. It's not even the target. It just gets mentioned. Is it progress? Sure, it's progress. But actually, the purpose of it, it seems strategically, was to distract and divide and get countries you know, behind that as a priority. Meanwhile, the United States enlisted those same allies like Canada, who are talking up the 1.5, to take things like loss and damage off the table. So there was a lot, you know, these are negotiations. They have a lot to do with egos. They have a lot to do with uh, the powers in, 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 the, in, the, in the different parts of the world. And they have a lot to do with just like skill of negotiating. And when, you, when you're a huge country like the United States with dozens and dozens and dozens of staff versus these countries with very few people there, you can pull one over on countries and you can outmaneuver them. And I think there was a lot of that. So many of the disappointments in the text are due to just like the game. But this is not a game. People here are saying this is life and death. This is people for the planet. This is not a game. Inside the bubble, you know, there's a lot of uh, trading and car, car trading and horse trading and they're playing games. And like, it's just very heartening to see so many people who are not falling for that. We pushed the, the pressure from outside, definitely created a better result in Le Bourget than there would have been. There's no question. We should claim that as a victory, but it's nowhere near enough. And people, I think, have their eyes open this time. We're here in Paris, but you were talking about the, the role of the U.S. and Canada. How would you assess the, the climate movements in the U.S. and Canada right at the moment? Well, I've been in Europe for uh, almost two months now, uh, touring with uh, the film This Changes Everything, connected to Naomi Klein's book of the same name that I directed. And it's been very, very interesting being a Canadian, a Canadian in Europe. We're normally sort of in awe of European social movements. We have movement envy when we come to Europe. Um, but in fact, we're finding that after these grinding years of austerity and climate uh, particularly being brushed off the table in Europe by these uh, economic struggles, not enough people connecting the dots between austerity and climate justice, which is something that's starting to happen. But you know, it's been a really hard time in Europe. In North America, we've had a, a string of, of, of amazing victories over the last six or seven years. The Keystone XL pipeline was canceled a few weeks ago by Obama after a six-year struggle. The company that built that pipeline was so sure that it was going straight through that they bought the pipe. And for six years, there's been hundreds of millions of dollars of pipe sitting in fields down the multi-thousand kilometer trail of that pipeline. And now they have to figure out how to dispose of it. We've stopped all the other export pipelines. There hasn't been a single new pipeline from the Alberta tar sands, the largest industrial project on Earth, the worst carbon crime in progress on Earth. There hasn't been a single new pipeline 
in all of these past six or seven years. In the Powder River Basin in Montana and Wyoming, where the largest deposit of coal in the United States and one of the largest in the world is, they need a complex series of new mines and railroads and export terminals on the coast in order to export that coal to, to Asia. Because coal use is declining in the United States, they've been closing a lot of coal-fired power plants. Not a single piece of that infrastructure has actually moved forward in the last few years. And more important, than the, and then we've got fracking bans in New York State and other places. The investment movement has exploded in the last three years. So we've had this string of victories in North America, which we're very unused to. They've been against governments. In Canada, a viciously right-wing uh, petro government over the last 10 years that we just got rid of. But even in the United States, against the Obama administration, which while he said a lot of good things about climate and has done some good climate policy by executive order, um, he's pursued an all of the above energy strategy, which means that they fracked the hell out of the back in uh, shale oil uh, deposit surpassing Saudi Arabia to become the largest oil producer in the world and the fracking explosion in, in the United States. So there's been a hostile climate in, in North America for climate activism and yet uh, climate activism has really surged. And what's really heartening and maybe one of the secrets of a success is that we're forging new alliances. We're connecting the dots between different issues. We've been bringing the trade unions along to make connect the dots around climate. But most importantly, First Nations, the indigenous people in North America have been leading both in the struggle against to keep carbon in the ground, uh, against the uh, the infrastructure of carbon, the pipelines and mines, um, but also leading in in solar uh, energy installations and and trainings and economic development in some of the poorest communities in North America, and indigenous communities. And we in the settler community have been making alliances with First Nations. They've been leading. We've been connecting with them, and we've been building you know rural and urban people. Like all through these pipelines have sort of traced new lines of connections where the webs of, of toxic infrastructure have also served as webs of connection among communities. So you have rural farmers and ranchers and First Nations, people on the coasts and the cities and people in the heartland making common cause. And, and that's very fruitful and, and it's been working for us. So we're hoping that you guys in Europe can uh, catch up for once. Okay, well, Abby Lewis, we're going to do our best here in, in Paris and in Europe. That was Abby Lewis here at the uh, Red Lines Climate March in Paris. Thanks very much.